So with that, I want to go ahead and introduce the speaker. Uh, the talk today is the Martin County, Texas Superstack Developing the Sweetest Spot in the Midland Basin. And the speaker is Derek Buster uh, with Guide On Energy. So Derek Buster is a petrophysical advisor at Guide On and Swallowtail Royalties Holdings Corporation located in Irving, Texas. Guide On operates approximately 45,000 gross acres in Martin County, Texas. Swallowtail Royalties Holdings manages approximately 12,000 net royalty mineral acres located in the Martin, Howard, Midland, and Glasscock counties. He currently advises on subsurface evaluation and development of unconventional resources in the Midland Basin core. Prior to joining Guidon, he was a petrophysicist at Stone Energy Corporation and Apache Corporation, working North American shale in the Appalachian Basin, Permian Basin, Alberta Basin, and several frontier exploration projects in lesser known shale basins. He has 12 years operational Experience with Schlumberger and Baker Hughes in the Gulf of Mexico, North American land. He has co-authored several SPE and SPWLA publications related to delivering significant cost savings to operators through leveraging technology as a first adopter. Uh, with that, De uh, Derek, if you'd like to go ahead and take the screen from me and, and get started. But uh, everybody, just remember, uh, Derek's talk will take about 45 minutes. We just ask for your patience and to keep your mics muted throughout the talk. Um, if you have any questions or anything, please take note of those. And after the conclusion of Derek's talk, we will open up for a Q&A, which I will moderate. And so you can raise your hands, and uh, I'll be sure to call on you as uh, as we take those questions. Uh, we're going to try to respect everybody's time here, so we're going to try to be done within an hour from this point. Uh, but if the discussion is fervent and moving forward, we, of course, we will try to entertain further questions, and Derek has agreed to do that. So with that, Derek, uh, the, the floor is yours. All right, uh, thank you, Brian. I'm trying to <laughs> find the uh, pointer again, um, but uh, I think I've lost it. So um, anyway, I'm assuming everybody can see my mouse cursor. Uh, first off, I would like to thank the Houston Geological Society for the opportunity to present this evening, and uh, Brian Guzman for organizing this event. I would also like to thank the Board of Management at Guide on Energy for their continued support of our work and the encouragement to speak with you tonight. Over the past 20 years, I've had many influential people help steer my career, my family, my colleagues, and mentors. Some of you are likely attending this virtual meeting tonight. Thank you for inspiring me, especially in the toughest of times. This talk is dedicated to you. So the Martin County, Texas Superstack uh, developing the sweetest spot in the Midland Basin. So uh, our agenda is going to be to cover uh, kind of a funny slide and then an overview of God on. Um, in order to talk about some concepts and how they apply to our business, specifically logometry, uh, we're, we'll talk a little bit about how we dissect problems, uh, what we actually know and what we don't know, and then making a case for repeatability. So the current state of oil and gas, if I had to describe it, 2012 the movie looks like a pretty good comparison. Most people are in a panic, and right now, you just have to be calm about it. So Guidon is centrally located in Martin County, Texas. We only have uh, operations in Martin County. Uh, a lot of our royalty holdings are in the four corners of this particular county. Um, we tend to develop uh, six to seven stack targets all the way from the middle primary to the uh, Wolf Camp B. And our acreage kind of covers some of the deeper portions of the Midland Basin uh, running across uh, Martin County into the southeast of Martin County. But all 45,000 acres are in Martin County. So the theory of logometry, uh, it was um, first postulated by Eamon Tafani in 2015 at a TED conference. I watched this video, um, I want to say probably seven months ago, and it kind of struck me about how we go about our processes. So the process of logometry is quantifying things we know we don't, do not know. 
And I think um, it's probably uh, ironic that uh, a famous defense secretary also has the same sort of logic. But imagine that inside the circle is everything we know. Outside the circle is everything we know we do not know. Pogometry represents the segue to creativity. It's the edge of the circle, the limit of what is fact. Things we do not know are mostly assumptions. I've also put the YouTube video link on this uh, screen as well, so I encourage everybody to go and look at it. So how does legometry apply to oil and gas on the uh, development? Well, the process begins by removing your biases, your ego, and keep kind of keeping an open mind to everybody's. Also, everybody has to have a blind spot. Management has a blind spot. Engineering has a blind spot. Data science is out of the blind spot. Don't mistake an abundance of information for sufficiency of knowledge. That's really important here. Uh, big data providers are not going to solve our problems for us. Uh, our industry suffers uh, from a lot of people who have knowledge pretension and knowledge inflation. Uh, people in companies proclaim you to know more than they do. Uh, this is pretty evident when you look at uh, certain publications from Wall Street and some amount of analytical outfits. They seem to talk a lot, but really don't have an answer. And a lot of these turnkey engineering and service providers that have invested in big data, it's generally for sale, but most of the time, the known conclusions are really admitting that they don't know. So in two in January of 2020, uh, there was this talk, uh, this panel talk about the state of private equity. And I made a clip it of um, Gabriella Morrow. Uh, it's about two and a half minutes. I'm going to play it, and I just want you to listen to it because a lot of it is involves this particular talk. I think another thing to add is that if you just say trust is at the heart and soul of a lot of this, you know, you can solve a lot of problems. You know, if the banks and the investors feel like they trust the oil and gas operators to deliver efficiently year in and year out, then they're probably going to spend money. You know, there's a lot of money on the sidelines. Well, what are they waiting for? You know, a lot of times oil and gas companies, unfortunately, we haven't been very good recently in predicting our performance for our developed cases. But if we go back to when the show started, about 2009, 2010, prices were very, very good. You know, it's almost like you could do no wrong, okay? And when you can do no wrong, everyone's making money, but you're not truly assessing how good or how bad you are. It's a nice way of saying you can screw up a lot in a hundred dollar oil. Well now, years down the road, it's time to pay the piper. You know, when we were completing horizontal wells, we were making all kinds of variable changes at the same time. You know, we were changing our wells facing, our lateral length. Our, our cluster spacing, our cluster size, our stops and fluid, we're changing so many different things. And now all of a sudden, we have to actually be efficient with our capital. We don't know which variables and which knobs to pull right now. I say, okay, I'm going to maximize my volume with as an efficient amount of capital as possible. We can't physically do that. I've yet to see an operator actually say, oh, I've been changing my completion design for the past three or four years, and I like it, I'm going to stick with it. Instead, I see operators every year changing their completion design because they're changing too many things at the same time. They can't pinpoint exactly what is causing the good and what is causing the bad. And unfortunately, that, I think, has caused us to over-predict a lot. Okay, and now that we're predicting, all these investors that have all this money on the sidelines, they don't trust us anymore. And so until we develop that trust back, you know, that money's going to stay on the sidelines. So, quantifying the unknowns. Legometry is a separation of knowns and unknowns. In the current paradigm, you get these general questions by our bankers. What is perspective, both geologically and geographically? What determines repeatable performance? What about development order? What about the optimal development pattern? Which completion design works? 
what effects do parent wells have on the children or child wells on the parents and having more children even be avoided and a lot of operators the responses are well, the offset, offset production says this rock works the average eur type curves in this area are so many mbo per foot development may be driven by lease expiration if it's not held by production Company X, Y, and Z around us are going 32 to 60 wells a section, and we believe this company. 90% uh, of operators use Design X, so we will too. And the real questions are for five through seven, and that's the focus of this talk. But overall, the industry is seeming to move towards accepting six, which is how do parents affect children and children affect parents instead of solving seven which is how can I avoid having children in the first place so let's talk about what is perspective so we know all these things oil and place maturity hydrocarbon properties all these petrophysical properties we all compute them we all make measurements on them we delineate our acreage position most operators have invested to know their rocks and Hopefully, have people to help them understand what is perspective. So, why don't we solve these unknowns, which are like track geometry and recovery factors? What determines where people's performance? Well, we know, you know, at least from the economic standpoint, all the costs that go into the well, having no interference, and a predictable decline in EUR. If you can do that, then you can determine whether or not you can make money. But the problem is, is that if we don't know the geometry, then you're going to suffer with being able to predict repeatability. So all the unknowns are EURs for completely bounded wells with no geometric interference, parent-child sibling frac geometry and SRV, proximal depletion effects. If you're attempting to make a cheaper well, to improve your recovery or your return on investment without actually knowing whether or not you can repeat that performance, it's pretty unlikely you're gonna do it. And I think that's where the industry kind of is right now. Some companies still believe if you put less money into a well, you can actually get the same performance out of the parent well. That's not possible without a predictable outcome. Well spacing trends overall are getting wider just to improve the repeatability and overcome the interference. It's almost an acceptance of the geometry they have. This is definitely going to have a negative impact on the economics of your position. A lot of rock and acreage and value in your asset is going to get wasted for less less oil to the tank. And once you start destroying the rock, you can't go back and fix it. So for people who have really gone and pushed on the accelerator, it might be a little late. Which completion design works? So these knowns are kind of public. That they are usually in IHS or Interbus. You can you can find these these volumes in general from public data sets, and there's a lot of it. There's lots of big data. But the unknowns, the stage length, the cluster space, and the injection rate, and the geometry overall, those are mostly unknowns. In fact, there's almost no data in a public data set which talks about a well's cluster spacing or their stage length or what rate they were pumped. All of these are critically important pieces of information to model a well geometry or the, the stimulated rock volume. An estimate recovery, recovery and compare which designs work. Investors will begin to trust a company that can repeat or improve performance when they know what the design changes are doing to that recovery. So we have been based on fluid systems over time. If we look at 2012 to 2020, what we see is that about the first four or five years, the average breakdown of who was pumping what was pretty steady. But then in 2016, there was a shift to more of this thin fluid, slick water stuff and less thicker fluids. So the chart kind of indicates a, a shift away from hybrid completion designs. Why is that? 
Is it the cost? If an operator doesn't fully understand their geometry in 2016 and they're changing their geometry, they're really not going to find out what that geometry change is going to do until 2018. And when they go back to go offset the parent wells in 2020, they might actually find out they got bad, bad children because they don't know the spacing effects of what they pumped. So let's talk a little bit about geometry in general. We all go through geometry in sixth or seventh grade. Kind of ironic. Uh, I postulated some of this stuff with my seventh seventh grader while Copeland Coda did. And one thing kind of stuck out to me. It doesn't really matter what surface area you create, because at the end of the day, the volume is a relationship between the area and its width. And so if you know all these things, let's say you know all the fluid system and the volume and the size of the problem, the concentration, the rate, the length, and the cluster spacing, shouldn't we be able to solve the fraction geometry in SRV? Or any geometric shape, the volume is always the product of the surface area times its width. So what do we know? A fracture must be wider than the largest single grain of sand pumped into that fracture. And that's it. That is the limit of what we know as fact. If you pump a piece of sand down the well into a crack, it, that crack has to at least be that wide. And the distribution of 300 million grains of sand into a fracture is much, much greater than its width. So it's pretty easy to make some approximations where the volume of that crack or set of cracks is equal or approximately equal to its surface area. Once you establish this kind of relationship, then it's a little easier to do the math. So let's calibrate it. So guide on, we have microseismic data set. We pump 43 monitored stages at 63,000 pounds and one PPG per, per stage into each cluster volume. So that created an average service area of about 273,550 square feet. And you can see the dimensions on the average, about 225 feet vertical growth and 387 feet half length. What's interesting is it doesn't even matter what that shape is, as long as you make the relationship between cluster volume and surface area, it can go in any direction. What we did is knowing that if we add more clusters, we artificially create more cracks. We can then make an assumption about how big those cracks are going to grow away from a well. So applying the limit of what we know, and all things being constant except the cluster spacing, all the other things that are going into the equation. The surface area is a redistribution of the cluster volume into the number of cracks it creates per treated cluster. And that the average shape is going to be defined by the stresses, and it's going to be defined by the rock type. But if you were to go back and put this stuff in a bench that's of the same rock type and then under the same stress conditions, that shape is going to tend to be uniform, no matter what it is. One other thing to note, each of these shape dimensions is solely defined by the number of clusters. You can see the pounds per foot is constant. The 20 over 150, it's just 20 clusters per 150 feet, or a profit loading volume of about 15,000 pounds at one PPG. If you make these assumptions, then it's a lot easier to actually model the geometry that you're putting into your development. Let's consider one other thing. If I know that the volume that I pump into a well is some constant, and all I'm doing is redistributing that amongst more cracks, then it 
the thing that it's changing is the surface area in each crack. So take, for instance, you have two volumes of rock. This represents a 150-foot stage. The radius of this particular drawing is 150 feet and 20 clusters compared to 150 feet with five clusters. The equivalent surface area of each crack is the same, 0.4 one for million square feet. But it's SRV is a function of how big that crack is integrated down the well bore. Essentially you have more rock volume with fewer clusters. So what does that do if you consider that the volume that you are actually contacting is less with more clusters? Theoretically, as the SRV is reduced, the EUR is also reduced unless the recovery factor improves. So let's look at a few of these examples from our well set. We have a 330-foot wine rack wolf camp development. These are 3,000 pounds a foot, 15 clusters, 150 foot stages, 30,000 pounds per cluster. The dimensions are pretty easy to calculate from these ovals. What we can see is that the spacing dimensions don't show that there's any connection between these wells. If we go to 660 feet, there's even more distance between them. And as we get them closer together vertically, we can see that that dimension it's, it gets squeezed, but they're still, for the most part, creating their own SRV. Our definition is a repeatable well would have little or no influence on the stimuli of rock near its neighbor. Therefore, the well appears to have created an independent SRV. Here's the lower Sprayberry development. So the top top row of wells and the bottom row of wells are in the same development unit in, Holt, in our Holt North development. What you can see is that we've changed the cluster spacing for each well, which gives it a slightly smaller dimension SRV-wise. And we did this to determine whether or not these wells were in communication and if they had their SRV. The idea being, as we got more and more clusters, we would be able to control some of that growth. What does a non-repeatable well look like? Well, in 2019, Guidon initiated a sampling program with or to do geochemical fingerprinting and allocation work. It showed that our UL wells, the 10, 12, and 14, had significant contributions of gel mill oil. And you can see here on the log, this is the gel mill resource section. Then you have the upper and lower Sprayberry Shale section, and then the Dean and the Wolf Camp A. Well, based on the geometries where these wells are landed, it doesn't, sh it doesn't appear that we broke into anything that should be contributing gel mill oil. Well, this made us do a little bit of homework. And after a detailed review of the geology and the engineering, what we figured out is that these wells were completed into their heel sections because they were on these pad locations. And that means that the SRV included, included production that was outside of the intended target. So in theory, you can't replicate these wells unless you complete them the same way up into the heel. So considering the actual shape is unknown, we don't know the real shape, that really isn't important for what we want to establish, which is a relationship between design changes and the production results. So what you're seeing here is groups of wells based on their cluster volume 
with EUR, thousands of barrels of oil per thousand feet, and a six month cumulative volume per thousand feet. So in the upper left, you have the middle spray berries, that's four wells. The average six month cumulative oil increases by about 4,000 barrels per thousand feet in six months. And the EURs improve by about 10%. What that means is, is that by actually having more cracks in a 150 foot section of the well, we were able to drain effectively more oil. In other words, the recovery factor went up. This is a really important piece of information because if you look at all the wells in their respective benches, the Joe Mill, also a positive indicator. The upper lower Sprayberry, also a positive ind indicator. As you get to a smaller and smaller geometry where you have more control and less interference, you're seeing more production. You're seeing more recovery. This is really important because if you're going to go and look at potentially offsetting child wells, you have to be able to determine what that geometry looks like from 2014 or 2012. If you think about it, back then we were doing 250 or 300 foot stages with four or five clusters of stage of pumping maybe 1,000 or 1,200 pounds of sand. Those geometries are huge. If we look at what would it be, what would it look like if we created similar geometries that just increased the number of clusters? So we have a, a set of wells down here at the bottom, Buck, the Ethereum, and, and Colt, both campies. They're very similar in terms of their six month cubes, but you're seeing a, a positive indicator of more sands and more clusters give you a higher EUR, even though their geometries are the same relatively the same. The same with the Wolf Camp A. These are also the same geometry, but it's a pretty compelling argument that you have more cracks, you get more oil. What does a non-repeatable well look like? Well, all of the geometry here might suggest that each well has its own SRV. This is the ideal case. This is where you have 100% cluster treatment. And we already know that we don't do that, not in every stage. So when you look at the oil allocations, this was a, a pretty key finding to be able to determine how much communication we had. Three of these four UL wells, the seven, the four, and the one, all have contributions from this lower, lower superior shale zone. We didn't find that in any of our other UL wells. And so when you look at the spacing, these are 180 foot vertical spacing. The spacing on our whole north development was 240. So 60 feet vertical dimension. And now I already have wells that are in communication. And we can see it in the allocation data. What do non repeatable wolf camp wells look like? Well, in several of these instances, our wells are just simply too close together or we try to put too many. And whenever you look at non-repeatable well performance, the definition is I can't put a single well in any one of these spots and replicate its performance because they're all in communication and their geometries are all asymmetric. So if I put one well in, I can't repeat its geometry. Non-repeatable well performance by bench. So you can see some of these geometries are quite large. What we find is, even with the larger geometries, as you get to the smaller geometries, you start to see better rate and better recovery. So I guess the, the question is, we have a lot of non-repeatable wells, which are also high performing. But in general, if you look at the wells that are connected to the best of good wells, there's always some substandard performer that's involved in general. Let's also consider cluster efficiency. So 
I had this discussion about a hybrid completion versus a slight water completion. Well, for Guidon, we tried both. We tried, you know, we've, we've drilled most of our wells as a hybrid design and about a dozen wells with slick water design. What we find is that on average, out of the 30 wells, 250 stages that we've traced, 94% of the clusters fully treated. But with slick water, that goes down significantly to about 75%. Well, if you think about that, I'm having to pump 25% more of my load into the remaining open clusters. So if I have very few clusters, let's say four, and I drop a cluster, that means I have to put the remaining 25% into the other three clusters, which grossly grows my geometry. So cluster efficiency is an unknown because we don't trace every stage. But statistically speaking, if you trace enough of them, you can get a trend. And applying a trend is where we're at it. This is, this is sort of where this talk is going. So if you investigate public IR materials, some of the old ones, you can actually figure out what it was that a company was going to try in changing their design. So for this company from 2015 to 2017, they tried to keep their geometry constant. In other words, the same sort of X and Y dimensions. And they added more clusters closer together in 2016. So they were keeping the geometry the same, but just adding more cracks to improve recovery. And then in 2017, they reduced their geometry and added more, even more cracks to improve their recovery. And so when you think about this, you can take public IR data and determine what somebody's load of changing their geometry is. What we need to do as an industry is be more transparent about what changes we're making to our geometry if we ever want to gain the trust back of Wall Street or the investment community. Because until they figure out what it is that you're doing, nobody's ever going to lend you money again. So here's an ideal case on well geometry and offsetting. So Operator X uses slick water design, which we already talked about having a lower efficiency, and their geometries compute to some volume that's like this. And then we come in and we offset these wells. Well, at first glance, it doesn't look like there's a lot of communication. But you have to remember, this is 100% cluster efficiency. And these older wells, likely because they were slick water, don't have that kind of efficiency. So when you look at it, adding in a change in the efficiency, you can get a trend. You can see where these immediately offsetting wells are having communication problems potentially with the cracks that were created from these older wells. And you can see it in the recovery. And you can see it in the rate. And I think this is a big problem that we're going to face, especially with offsetting older design wells. Because a lot of these, a lot of this information, when you look at it, a 16,000 pound per foot well doesn't sound like a very big frack. But because you're pumping, you know, significant volume into only three clusters in that stage, it's a gigantic loading parameter. And that's why I think we've sort of underestimated what our PUDs are, or overestimated what our PUDs are, and underestimated how much of an effect these wells are going to have on our development. So... Just to sum it up, the simple view of well EUR without some definition of geometry is pretty unreliable for predicting repeatability. The oil fingerprinting and the allocations have helped us as a tool to determine how we can measure the vertical dimension of our geometry. Ligometry enables us to realize what is fact and put more focus on what we assume and really solve the problems that have more impact. 
there's still time to change the herd paradigm in our business. A lot of people looking over the fence and thinking the grass is greener. But however, once you break the rock, there's no going back. And so making a bad well or making some bad wells, you're going to end up making some bad choices. You'll change things like your, your, the amount of money that you'll put into your well or the, the geometry that you're going to, you're going to keep and, and you're just going to assume that it's something that's wrong with the rocks. Our industry should be playing something more like three-dimensional chess where we really maximize our resource and not skip lanes and leave money in the ground. So I'd like to acknowledge my coworkers and my managers and our CEO. Uh, they've all been very supportive of this material and the type of work that, that I'm trying to do. And also I'd like to thank uh, Jeffrey Adams and Tanner Wood and Stephanie Friels. They've all, all been really big contributors to our project. So why do I think it's the sweetest spot, which is the topic of the talk? For us, we've mapped this whole basin. We have a very substantial database that's characterized everything. We have mapped every petrophysical property in this basin. And of all the properties that we've mapped, the strongest correlation to performance temperature. And I've got a short gradient movie here to show you. The highest heat flow is radiating from Northwest Martin County. So you can see where I have a star here. And that's this type of The first vertical derivative of the last slide is the gravity. And it shows that we have a lower crustal density right below this hot spot. I'm gonna play this now. Twenty twenty, what can you say? And I'll take any questions you have. Derek, thank you uh so much for taking the time to present all that. Uh with that, uh I'm gonna open the floor for questions. I'm gonna just provide you all a quick um way we're gonna do this. So you can see that there's a chat window at the bottom of the screen. Um, if you'd like to ask Derek a question, please uh post in the chat window that you'd like to ask a question, number one, and I can unmute you, and you can ask the question if you'd like to, or you can just ask the question in the chat and I will repeat it uh, for the audience if they don't wanna, if they don't know how to read the chat, and uh, Derek will answer it that way. So um, with that, I did, I did wanna open up the floor for those questions. Some stuff going on here. Uh, I'll go ahead and um, ask, ask Brian Brian's question. Uh, any ideas as to what is causing the crustal density anomaly in the area? You know, it's very interesting. Um, you know, I studied a little bit of that when I was in graduate school. And so there are these uh, maps developed by a professor uh, Blakely. I think he's at uh, he's from the University of Colorado, I believe. And um, he's got a... Uh, a time-based movie which sort of talks about the paleo-tectonic activity around this area. And uh, when you look at uh, around 450 to 300 million years ago, you can really see that there's quite a bit of uh, subduction and some suturing that's going on around this area. And uh, on a wider uh, gravity map, you can actually see where some of that subduction has taken place even through the central basin platform and so um, i think that a lot of that the lower density uh, that you're seeing uh, may actually be from some of the paleo tectonic activity that's going on awesome thanks derek uh second question um is from joe it says hi derek have you looked at downhole cameras that image perforation wear as a proxy for efficiency? You know, it's uh, it's funny that uh, we talk about this, but, you know, the, we have two things going on. You have a problem and you have a symptom. So the problem is, is that we tend to inject with a certain rate at surface, but then we have 
these clusters are home. The more clusters you add, the lower per cluster rate the actual rate is. And so the erosion problem is a velocity issue. If you have all these fluid mechanics that are going on, if you have very few clusters and you're pumping in 100 barrels a minute, you're going to end up with a lot of erosion over those three clusters. But if you have 20 clusters and you're dividing that rate by 20 instead, the velocities going into that are a lot lower. And so overall, my opinion is, is that we don't have as much erosion potentially because the distribution of the rate is, is so high. But no, we have not looked at cameraing our wells. It's a it's time consuming and laborious uh, activity. So once we once we finish a well, we we can bring it on. Thanks, Derek. And uh, just one thing I do want to repeat for everyone here: um, Derek has agreed for us to record this talk and post it to the HGS educational channel on YouTube. Um, I'm not sure about the timeline for when this video will be posted. But uh, I do want to thank Derek again for agreeing and giving the approval to do that. So uh, thank you, Derek, and, and for those who are curious. Uh, next question is from Jim. You mentioned temperature at the end. You related well performance to heat flow. Is it higher thermal gradient or proper heat flow? Question mark. So the gradient is, is more of the change as you move towards surface. But the actual reservoir temperature is quite high. So the when you look at uh, this particular spot in Northwest Martin, we actually have found that, you know, the reservoir temperature compared to some of our other areas is quite high. So, you know, PVT being what it is, you know, obviously if you have more temperature in your rocks, you have a lower viscosity and you're able to more, make more fluids. And so I think there's a pretty compelling link if you had similar source maturity if you had similar petrophysical properties but the only difference was you have this temperature change that's elevated the odds are that you have basically more you know energy in the kitchen and you're able to push up push out more fluids awesome thanks derek next question is from mark is there an assumption that all laterals are quote unquote in zone and have not drifted above or below that specific target horizon in other parts of the reservoir. What is the thickness of the target zone that Gaidan is striving to achieve? Well, you know, at this point, um, we are trying to pattern our wells so that way they don't communicate vertically. And the allocation work has shown that we have pretty decent control. There's, you know, we had some earlier wells which were a much larger geometry, at least mathematically. And so what it would appear like is that as we've added more clusters to reduce the geometry, the complexity of the geometry, but actually add the, the more complex components, the you know, higher fracture density, we've been able to contain more of that growth, to contain more of the, the sausage, so to speak, near the well board. And so um, I think in terms of what we consider in zone laterals, it is sort of suspect. I mean, obviously we're using gamma rays and mud logs, and in some cases we may be using XRF or other things to kind of tell us whether or not the rocks are similar. But it is still, uh, it's an engineering place. I mean, we just make a lot of assumptions about it being in a target, but we have found cases where, you know, we've crossed the fault or we see some anomaly and, um, and so you see uh, some of those in the allocation data. You know, when you look at the oils, you can actually see if you have maintained your target and whether or not uh, you have an oil that's coming from a different zone you didn't expect. All right, thank you. Um, last question I have right now. Well, we get some more coming in, but uh, regarding temperature, is there any particular measurement type you trust most? For instance, is the bottom hole temperature or geochemical ones such as vitronite reflectance or T T mat? So there's two different things you're talking about. One is that you're talking about um, the geochemistry. So the, the T max is actually a measure of when the volatile stop being expelled from the rock. And then you have reservoir temperature, which is actually present day. This is what is how hot it is down hole. 
So uh, there is some link, but not directly. And I think that it, when you look at, uh, say, trying to understand what the temperature, present day temperature is of the reservoir, we've kind of approached this from a, a, a log based problem. All logs are assumed to be run as soon as the well is TD, uh, our, our vertical control. And so on average, if you run a log and uh, it's compared to another log, then they should be similar in terms of the profile and should be similar in terms of how long they're in the hole, what the run times are. So using log-based temperatures may not tell you the exact reservoir temperature, but they can tell you the gradient. And that's why I, I make this assumption or I've made this movie to kind of, you know, show you what we feel. And the, the best part is, is when you put, you know, these particular um, components like oil in place or maturity or let's say clay volume or any, any of the petrophysical properties we like to look at, when you put all of these in to like an Alteryx ranking uh, system or something where you can do some statistical big data, temperature always ends up at the top. All right. Um, the question, have you developed any seismic attributes regarding the temperature phenomenon to highlight sweet spots? Um, so I don't think they're quite as, um, I, I do think that some of these uh, temperature variations are, are pretty localized. I mean, it's it, there is a point at which you get into a beam which is fairly um, continuous. But I think especially when you get to like a subducted area where you may have some plumes or uh, plutons or other things that may be uh, causing you to have you know this radiation difference, especially your heavy iron oxides which may be cooling over time. A lot of that stuff is going to have a much higher um, you know thermodynamic property. Than say a low density material, and so you know if you have if you look at specific heat and how radiation comes out of the earth, um, I think that uh, you know materials that are really dense obviously are going to have to have they're going to have to cook you know heat it up longer in order to get to a res certain reservoir temperature. So getting to a lower density environment where your crust is actually a lot lower density, your heat's going to flow out a lot easier. So. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much, Derek, for taking the time. Um, if there's any other questions, I think we'll um, just out of respect for everyone's time, uh, please reach out to Derek on LinkedIn. He has said that he expects some people to reach out to him and encourages it. So uh, look up Derek Buster with Guide on Energy on LinkedIn. Uh, reach out to him. Uh, I'm sure he'd love to have a discussion with you. If you have any quest additional questions? Uh, I'm going to.